Welcome to the Freedom Line, the podcast for the Center for Individual Freedom, where we meet nonsense with common sense. Here's your host, Renee Giacchino. Thank you for tuning in to the Freedom Cast. Joining me again is Andy Oak. Andy is the first ladies' man. He's, it's been my pleasure to welcome him very frequently to the program, and he's always one of our special guests and very well received by the listeners. You can follow Andy and his wonderful work at firstladiesman.com. Now, I typically try to time an interview with Andrew when there's something spectacular going on in our world as it may relate to our first ladies, and I guess in this case, it would be the first man, which we will be talking about. Um, And of course, it's March. We all know what that means. At least I hope we do. It means that we are celebrating women in history. So a perfect time to welcome back Andy Oak. Andy, thanks so much for joining me again. Renee, it was an absolute pleasure. I always get a smile on my face when I see an email or text message or call come in. And it's funny, I was thinking about this. I'm like, well, I should prep, and what are we going to talk about? I'm like, no, there's no prep here. We're old friends. We just chat, and you throw up questions, and I pull them down, and you, you, you throw up interesting perspectives, and I, and I give my feedback. It's just an absolute pleasure to be here with you again. Well, thank you. And I love following you as well on Facebook because every day I get to learn something new. Tell me about what it is that you've been doing. Tell the listeners every day you're posting a day in history and then how it may relate to one of our first ladies. Yeah, I, you know, that's interesting, and we've never discussed that. So I come from a TV background. That's how I become the first ladies' man. I was a series producer for C SPAN and the White House Historical Association's First Ladies Influence and Image. And that led to my travels, my research, my books, my website, my speeches and everything. So this has worked on so many television shows that I've worked on because everyone likes it. Everyone likes water cooler talk. Everyone likes little trivia. Everyone likes tidbits. What was the number one song? Man Walked on the Moon, The Wright Brothers Flew, Washington Cost of Delaware. And I take those historical little little nuggets from each day and i tell who was first lady when that happened i think yesterday it was a it was a uh, um, not so famous not not to me anyway uh, classical music composer not one of the big ones and it was his birthday well ida mckinley was first lady when this gentleman was born his name escapes me right now and then i told an interesting fact about how in the 1800s the late 1800s ida mckinley's father thought it was so important her name was saxon her uh, maiden name and ida saxon's father thought it was important for a woman to be independent this is in the late 1800s this is not normal thought process this is not normal speak this is not normal actions He gave his daughter, Ida, a job in his bank in Canton, Ohio. He wanted her to be financially solvent and be able to live independently of a man should she need to. And this trickled over into a European trip that she took. And the the male chaperone, of course, for these young women wasn't handling the books and their finances. And Ida didn't think they would have money to make it to the end of the trip and have souvenirs for everyone. So she took the money from the chaperone and ran the rest of the trip as a young woman in the 1800s traveling through Europe and came back with beautiful gifts for everyone and extra money. I mean, this is, this is revolutionary thinking for, for, for parents for women of the day, for a woman to have this natural aptitude and gravitate towards this type of financial independence, financial responsibility. And it helped out later in life because her her husband was assassinated and left her alone with, with, with money and things to finance. And you see this happening a lot in history as men were typically older and dying, but before their wives and, and, and uh, I'd have, McKinley had this training from her father in a bank job. It's also where she happened to meet her future husband, William McKinley, came in as a young lawyer out of the Civil War. He practiced law after the Civil War. He was putting money in an account, took fancy to Ida. They get married. The next thing you know, she's first lady of the United States. And and as you as you indicate on your webpage, firstladiesman.com, dot com, I mean there is there is no formal training. There's no job description, no specific classes to prepare a woman or a man now for this role. You cannot major in first lady at any university, but certainly things like that being you know, trained in finances, you know, of course, etiquette, all of that has probably over time proved very benefit, proved uh, very beneficial for 
the first lady and now now the first man as it is. Speaking of, of college, you recently also posted, which I found quite interesting, about our first first lady to attend college. Tell us about that. Yeah, Lucy Hayes. She's another one of she's another one of my favorites. Um Lucy Hayes was the first woman was the first first lady to graduate from college, get a college degree. It was in Ohio and she went to um uh Wesleyan which was it called a different name at the time and uh, um where she ends up getting getting her degree. But you know you you mentioned the, the no training and the and the and the no stuff like that uh the, no no official roles or 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 outlines of the role all of these women you know the, these women of natural aptitude these women of in, natural intelligence these women with goals these women with ambitions they saw these type of men you could recognize these natural leaders there's a reason why these men took public office, ran for public office. I mean, especially in the early times when we were really developing in, you know, the, the, the 1800s, late 1700s, of course, in the beginning, and 1800s, you know, that we were really trying to figure out what all these roles were and make our mark as a, a new country. And these women with these big ideas, these women with these natural, even if it was subconsciously, they didn't know they were this smart or had these abilities, they gravitated towards these men that were going places because women had no rights. Women couldn't vote. Women couldn't own property. Women couldn't go to school. Women weren't expected to school, go to school. You know, when these women come out like Lucy Hayes and start going to school, I mean, you know, this is instead of going to finishing school. This is instead of learning how, you know, where the, the fork and salad fork go and the knife and, and learning French and playing the harpsichord and, you know, all these things, that knitting and, and, and hand arts and things like painting, which are all great things to have and make a person a really well-rounded individual. But as far as studying literature and English and grammar and math and things like this that they got in school, people like Lucy Hayes were, were, were trailblazers. They were, they were transformative first ladies. And, and what I really like about Lucy Hayes is all throughout her, she was first lady of Ohio when her husband was governor of Ohio. She was going out into the field. She was using this intelligence. She was using her schooling. She was using her natural abilities to go out where women – we're not going at, at time. I mean, sure, if they were nurses or working in these facilities, but Lucy Hayes, as the wife of the governor of Ohio, was going into mental institutions, into veterans um, uh, hospitals, into orphanages, and looking at the surroundings, looking at the conditions, and coming back to her husband and saying, this one's really good. We need to do more of this. Or this one's really bad. We can't have people living like this. We need to improve this. Again, this is revolutionary thinking and going into places where women did not go. All the while, she's staying very humble. When she was in the role of first lady, she said, oh, the, the women that came before me were, were, were so much more capable and did such a more fantastic job. I'm only trying to live up to the examples they set, and I know that there are people in the future that will, will do better. But she was loved. She was loved in D.C. She threw great parties. And keep in mind, parties weren't just parties for eating and drinking and socializing. That's where business was conducted. That's where the serious summit and putting people next to each other at the dinner table or putting people just in the same room because we didn't have the modern conveniences of technology to communicate. Mail was, you know, I mean, you know, mail was mail. And it took a while. So if you get all these people in D.C., in the White House, talking and enjoying themselves and in a comfortable atmosphere, that for diplomacy and policy is, is worth its weight in gold. And, 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 and Lucy, was, Lucy was at the top of her game. We are talking to Andy Oak. He's an award-winning TV producer who's traveled the world in search of provocative stories. He began his adventure as he traveled America for over a year, documenting the lives of every First Lady of the United States. His C-SPAN series was titled First Lady's Influence and Image. He authored two wonderful books. They're titled Unusual for Their Time, On the Road with America's First Ladies. There's volume one and volume two. You'll want to pick up both of them, which you can do at com. Andy, you mentioned the women being trailblazers, but you also recently post that they were ordinary as well. Tell me about some of those who were maybe a little more ordinary. Yeah, sure. You know, we talk about first lady first. Abigail Fillmore is a perfect uh, woman to to talk about in 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 sort of the ordinary everyday what you would expect out of a woman that's not heavily involved in in politics or news or whatever. She's also Abigail Fillmore is one of two first ladies that taught 
her future husband, who became a president. Eliza Johnson is the other. Eliza Johnson, Andrew Johnson's wife, taught her husband, Andrew Johnson, how to read and write in his tailor shop in Greenville, Tennessee. He, when they were married and he was a full-blown adult, owned his own tailor shop and was very popular around town, she in the evenings would teach him to read or write because people were telling him what a great orator he was and what great opinions he had and what great perspective on life. And they wanted him to run for office and stuff like that. But the guy couldn't read or write, so she taught him how to read, or, read and write in the tailor shop after hours. So getting back to Abigail Fillmore, she was a librarian. She was a teacher. She's the first first lady with a day job. That's where we see this, like, regular person, you know? Is she, she, she's from East Aurora, New York, small town in, in upstate New York, and she meets uh, Millard Fillmore, who's coming into the library and coming into the school and wanting to learn. Um, I guess as a young adult, he was, he was uh, taking classes and things like that. And they fall in love. He builds a two-room house in East Aurora. They move in, and she starts for extra money tutoring in the front room by the fireplace where they also have dinners. You know, there's kind of like the kitchen and the bedroom in the back and then the front room. Then they build a, a second story with a sleeping loft later on. But this is just a regular gal. You know, from a small town, she's a teacher, she's a librarian, but she ends up getting into the White House, and one of the first things she sees when she gets there, she says, well, there's no library here. Now, you can see, this is, this is so fascinating to see, because these first ladies, again, no role, uh, no, no definition of role. They don't have to have a cause. They don't have to do anything right there. They're not elected. They're not paid. You know, and many women, because of health or age, decided not to take on the role of first lady. And, and this is much earlier on in our in our country's history. But then you see nieces and daughters taking on those hostessing duties. But anyway, when these women get into the White House, they take on causes naturally for things that are, are that they are passionate about. Abigail Fillmore was a librarian and a teacher. She comes into the White House, moves in as first lady, and she says, "Hey, there's there's no library." So she schedules a dinner, she gets the lawmakers down, and she got appointed a, a large sum of money for the day. It was, a, it was a couple thousand dollars, as I recall, to work with the Library of Congress, get duplicate copies of books, and start what became the very first White House Library. And one of those bookcases, bookshelves, and some of the books – are in the Fillmore home in East Aurora today. You can go there right now today, walk in the door, and look at something that was in the White House as the first, one of the pieces of furniture, the, the bookcase that was part of the first library, and it's just from some regular regular, regular gal from, from East Aurora, uh, New York. An ordinary woman doing extraordinary things. I think that's probably true of, of most, if not all, of our first ladies. So we are celebrating Women's History Month this month, the month of March. We're talking with Andy Oak, who is the first ladies man, and we're going to have to shift gears because we've got to talk about the first man now. Despite it being Women's History Month, we now have – the first second man, I guess you should say. Is it, there the we go. Yeah, I, 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 did, I didn't want to correct you, but, but, but yes, he, he, the, the, the first lady is the wife of the president, and we can only assume right. that the first gentleman will be the husband or partner of the first female president. And the vice president has his wife as the second lady. So Dr. Jill Biden was the second lady during the Obama administration with Mrs. Obama being the first lady, and now Doug Emhoff is the first second gentleman. Um, you know, so that's typically the title. Would, first, yeah, first second gentleman. Okay. Yeah, or just the second gentleman who he just happens to be the first man <laughs> to be married to a vice president. But it's it's curious, you know, and 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 this is interesting about Dr. Jill Biden too. You know, these women, much more so in modern times, twentieth century. You know, 20th century and beyond, have established themselves as independent of their husbands. You know, they, they've taken on their own causes. They've taken on their own personalities. They've gone on TV. They do their own interviews. They have their own staff. <clears throat> Excuse me. They have their own causes, their own work. So this is different from what we've seen in the, of course, in the, 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 the first two administrations in the 1700s, up into the 1800s, where it was just sort of like an extension of the president or a hostess. But we see these women in the 20th century getting their own independent personality as a first lady. Well, now 
with Dr. Jill Biden and, 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 and Doug Emhoff, we see them having personalities and, 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 and uh, they, they, they've, they've got a, a role independent of their title because they're both keeping their day jobs. And this is, this is – some people are going to not like it and some people are going to like it. That's just the way things go nowadays and, and historically as well. It's going to be interesting to see how much of themselves they give to each of these roles. Typically, the second woman um, uh, or, or the, the, the wife of the first – the wife of now I'm confusing myself. The wife of the vice president <laughs> hasn't done a huge amount. I, I mean, you know, you see, you see, like Pat Nixon. Pat Nixon was the most traveled second lady of all time, and she went all over the place and does a lot of ambassadorial work. When um, uh, Jill Biden and Michelle Obama were in the White House together, they had uh, they teamed up to do a lot of things. And 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 uh, Barbara Bush, of course, as as uh, the the wife of uh, George H W Bush when he was vice president, did did a massive amounts of work with literature and 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 reading and literacy and things like that. But you see Jill Biden as a woman who really has established herself as a second lady during the Obama administration, and now really stepping out and being involved and putting hearts on the the White House lawn for Valentine's Day and promoting hope and family and and doing her own speeches and supporting her husband's causes and jumping right in with her veterans program to get veterans integrated into jobs and society and communities and, and housing and education and all that kind of stuff. And it'll be curious to see how Doug Emhoff follows her lead. You know, he's got a great role model for being involved and being public and taking a role as the second gentleman that isn't a highly visible or highly public or highly active role. Uh, but I mean, you know, you go back to Tipper Gore. She's, she was up on Capitol Hill for the PMRC and the, the, the uh, advisory board for, for uh, 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 censorship on, on, on foul language and other things that, that she did in the, in the late 80s and 90s. So, you know, you, these roles, are, they can do what they want with them, but these are two very, very active people. They're, they're uh, uh, Emhoff's a, a younger guy, you know, and we'll see how much lawyering he does and how much second gentleman he does. But uh, Jill, Jill Biden's hitting the ground running, and I'm really excited to see where she takes this and what, she can, what work she continues that she's already established. Well, and she brings a, a, a nice perspective, I think, for the first second gentleman, having served as a, a second lady, you know, a second woman, having served as the vice president's wife and, and being given opportunities and, and taking on a very active role uh, together with Michelle Obama or under Michelle Obama, however you want to phrase it, um, probably gives her a, a better perspective in terms of, you know, wanting to make sure that, that you know, Doug doesn't feel second rate, doesn't feel, you know. Absolutely. That- Renee, you, you 100% couldn't agree more. He's got a great role model because she's been where he was, and when she was where he was, she was active. She was visible. She did things. So even if there might be a tendency or a reluctance to step out, I think she's going to be right there going, come on, Doug, let's do this. Let's go to this <laughs> event. Let's host our own thing. I mean, she's, she's a cheerleader. She's active and out there, you know. I mean, uh, Melania Trump did a lot more than she was given credit for. She did things more quietly, more like a Pat Nixon who did things very quietly, more like a Beth Truman who did things behind the scenes. Uh, Rosalind Carter was a lot right. like that. I mean, a lot of people don't know that Rosalind Carter sat in on every cabinet meeting and advisory board that she could. Now, she wasn't out there like Nancy Reagan going on, you know, having sitting on Mr. T's lap during Christmas time or, <laughs> or being on different strokes or slam dunking basketballs with Charles Barkley for just say no. But, I mean, you go back, there's a lot of first ladies that, that take that backseat role, and just because we don't see a lot of – you go back to the, to the 1920s, I mean, Grace Coolidge, she was at every baseball game. She was doing uh, 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 um, Easter seals and, and Christmas seal stamps for poor, as she brought uh, Helen Keller to the White House. Another – Grace Grace Coolidge, I'm kind of getting deep into things here, but Grace, Grace Coolidge, her first job, she taught – Deaf and 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 um, and uh, 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 deaf students in in um, uh, Northampton, Massachusetts, at the Clark School for the Deaf. That's that's revolutionary education and stuff for the for the early 1900s. And so she gets into the White House, and because she speaks sign language, because she taught deaf people, 
she brings Helen Keller in as a guest kind of thing. Again, what's near and dear to these women's hearts. But every time Grace could get in the front of the camera, she did. And there's, there's actually video of Grace, like jumping up and down and clapping at baseball games and, 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 and giving out the Easter seals with her dogs in front of their house with Santa Claus dressed up and all this other stuff. I mean, she was, she was pretty revolutionary and, and, and transformative as well as far as using what technology that was out there. So when you get these people that are very public and gravitate to, towards the public, which, you know, it helps also Jill Biden – was the wife of a senator for as long as we can remember, you know? I mean, mm-hmm. Melania Trump comes into this. She had a quiet, private, different kind of life, and she was thrust into this kind of thing. And, you know, she she did what she thought she could do or do best and did a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff with orphanages and, and um, children's hospitals, children's causes, obviously very near and dear to her heart. And, you know, she did it in her own way. Again, there's no rules. They don't have to do anything. We just criticize people when we think they're doing things that, in a way that we don't think they should be doing them. But they don't have to do anything. You know, it's interesting. I often think about what if Hillary Clinton had been president, and then we would have had our first first gentleman. But that first first gentleman would have been called President Clinton because presidents mm-hmm. don't lose the title president when they get out of there. But President Bill Clinton would not have been a host for President Hillary Clinton's White House. She would have used him for a number of different reasons, power struggles, uh, 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 Hillary needing to establish herself and other things. He would have done foreign travel and more like, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, Secretary of State kind of kind of work, ambassador kind of work. Chelsea Clinton would have been would have been her her hostess. It would have been mother and daughter in there, and the people that liked Hillary wouldn't have said boo. They would have loved it. They would have thought it was the greatest thing. But when Donald Trump thought about bringing his daughter in, people who didn't like Donald Trump criticized that, and of course people that didn't like Hillary would criticize it. But you know you're you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't in politics, especially these days. But it's interesting to see how all these dynamics work around a role that is so important, so influential, so powerful, yet it is undefined, it is unelected, and it is unpaid. Wow. It's, it's, and it's impressive. We are celebrating Women's History Month, talking with the First Ladies Man, Andy Oak. You can follow him at firstladiesman.com, where you can also pick up his fabulous books now in Volumes 1 and 2. And he's got to be working on 3, because now it, we've, we've got another new First Lady. Um, Andy, I, I do have to say these facts, all of this that, that you've committed to memory, I mean, you know more about these First Ladies than I can recall about my own siblings or even, quite frankly, my own children. <laughs> I, I, I'm just so impressed. Um, uh, before it's I weird, you know, isn't it? I, I, I'm no, like the rain it, man it, of first ladies. It, it, it's, it's incredible. I mean, it is, it is truly remarkable. Um, you recently posted, in, in honor of celebrating Women's History Month, uh, a wonderful quote from one of the first ladies who's given us a, a lot of really great quotes, Eleanor Roosevelt. And you posted, do one thing every day that scares you. Okay, dig into that big brain of yours. Tell me about a first lady who did something that was sort of really scary. Well, I'm going to go with the obvious answer. It's Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt, she became our longest sitting first lady as FDR is elected to an unprecedented and unrepeated four terms. But she was not a public person. Her her family, and this I find very – well, it's, it's horrible on a, on a number of different levels, but I also it doesn't make sense. She was called the ugly duckling. She had, for all of her wealth, for all of her privilege, she had a rough childhood. She had a very, very rough childhood. She lost both of her parents very early. Her father was Theodore Roosevelt's brother. So President Theodore Roosevelt actually walked his niece, Eleanor Roosevelt, down the aisle to marry her sixth cousin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, because her father had died. Her father died from injuries. He jumped out of a window at a, at a medical facility that was treating him for alcohol and opioid uh, addiction. It sound familiar? I mean, that stuff happens mm-hmm. today. You know, these, these women jump on these causes and try and do these things and have been trying to, to, to solve or bring awareness or help with problems that we've had since the beginning of time. Betty Ford on, on top of all of it with, with substance abuse and, and cancer. We could do a whole show on Betty Ford, a whole show on any of these women. But Eleanor Roosevelt was put down her entire life. She was told she's unattractive. And I'll tell you, right now, you can Google Eleanor Roosevelt Young. 
She was a very attractive woman. She was a very attractive woman. We all get old, and people are mean, you know? I'll just leave it at that. So <clears throat> she was called an ugly duckling by her family. She w- she married into someone who that she, she loved but ended up, you know, uh, there was infidelity in there that she was not, of course, it's stupid to say, that she was not happy about. Her her mother-in-law, Sarah Delano, was ruled everything. FDR was a mama's boy. You heard it here from the first lady's man first. The longest sitting, one of the most powerful presidents, wartime president, was a mama's boy. And he, did, he barely did anything without his mother's approval or her saying everything was okay. And that includes Eleanor Roosevelt didn't even have a seat at her own dining room table along the Hudson at, at Springwood because it wasn't her house. It wasn't FDR's house. It was Sarah's house. It was FDR's mom. And people sat where they were told to sit. So when FDR, right around the time he was diagnosed with polio, <laughs> excuse me, he also told Eleanor that he was having an affair. Well, Eleanor said, that, that's it. I'm, I'm done. I've given you children. I've given you the best years of my life. I'm, I'm, I'm out. And Sarah Delano steps in again and says, well, no, we're Roosevelt's. We don't get divorced. And there's too much money at stake and there's too much health at stake. Franklin has polio. You can't leave him when he's got polio. Everyone's going to lock down. We're just going to throw parties. We're going to be wealthy people and live happily ever after. Well, that wasn't good enough for Eleanor. So she had to step out and solve this problem for herself, which she probably didn't want to do because she wasn't a terribly public person. She had a very high-pitched voice. She was trained. She went to finishing schools and stuff because she was raised by her aunt and grandmother in in Europe, and she had kind of an an odd mixed accent and very high-pitched voice. Well, she hired a guy named Hal from Bethesda, Maryland, actually, to come up and reinvigorate FDR's political career from a wheelchair, basically. I've been in the study in Springwood where this all went down, and to stand in this history and feel this power and know what went on in this room is just remarkable. It's it's heavy. It's a heavy feeling. It's a good, heavy feeling. But she, in doing this with FDR, how explained that she would have to be his legs, literally, She would have to go out. She needed to learn how to speak publicly. She needed to learn policy. She needed to create her own persona to support FDR's persona that had physical gaps in it because of his handicap. And if she was going to make FDR this public person, she was going to have to become his right-hand woman, his first lady, and step out into an arena that she was very, very uncomfortable with. So if there's if there's no one better to put that quote out than her because she did it all the time. Otherwise, she would be stuck in a loveless marriage, in a house with a mother-in-law that she didn't like, unable to do anything that she wanted. It, 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 she's just a remarkable woman. That I tell you what, that is that is a scary story, a true story, and again, I think highlights why Eleanor Roosevelt is is one of our at least one of my favorite first ladies. Andy, thank you so much for your time. Um, you've over, I've overextended your time, but I so appreciate it. I could go on for hours with you, and you could continue to rattle off all these incredible facts right from memory. So impressive, as I said. Andy Oak, First Ladies Man. Follow him at firstladiesman.com or friend him on Facebook, and you too can learn something new every single day about these important women who have had the role of our First Ladies, First Ladies of America. Andy Oak, thank you again for your time. We appreciate it. Folks, pick up Volume 1, Volume 2, firstladiesman.com. Andy, thanks again. We'll talk